Well, if you can join me in your Bibles in John chapter 7, if it is true that God is indeed the captor of our soul, then we are held captive to his word joyfully. And this is how he speaks to us. This is how he changes our lives. As you work your way through the scriptures, there are some passages that are weightier than others. There are some passages that are more serious, you could say, than others. Warnings. This is one of those weightier warning passages. It's in John chapter 7, and we're looking at verses 32 through 36. It's where we find a rather shocking statement from Jesus. It's a warning that carries with it eternal consequences. And it's a warning about rejection. But not rejection from the unbeliever to God. We've seen that warning. We will see that warning over and over again. But the warning here about rejection is when God rejects the unbeliever. And the warning is this. There may come a time in an unbeliever's life when the hand of grace, restraining grace, God's hand of restraining grace is removed. And the day of grace comes to an end. When one's rejection of Jesus is sealed, and there's no more mercy given to the unbeliever. It's a frightening thought. But according to Jesus here, again, verses 32 through 36, for many of the religious leaders of the land, that day of rejection by God was soon. It was at hand. Look at verse 34. Here's Jesus' warning. You will seek me. And if you didn't read ahead and you know your Bibles, that phrase is normally followed with what? And you will find me. That's not what Jesus says here. You will seek me, and you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot. It will be impossible for you to come. Those are shocking words. So shocking, the leaders actually repeat Jesus' warning verbatim. Look at verse 36 at the very end. What is this statement that he said? You will seek me and will not find me. These leaders will hear the same warning again in John 8, in verse 21. I will go away and you will seek me, but rather than finding me, Jesus says, you will die in your sins. Where I am going, you cannot come. And again, it's shocking for them to hear that they repeat Jesus' warning verbatim. Verse 22 of John 8. So the Jews were saying, where I am going, you cannot come. This is the only saying in all of the Gospels that is repeated word for word on two separate occasions by those who hear it. It shocked the hearers. It stirred their consciences. It unnerved their self-righteous hearts. But not only are these words shocking for Jesus' original hearers, again, they're shocking for many of us here today. We can think of those promises, Deuteronomy 4. You will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. Or Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me. Or even Jesus, Matthew 7, seek and what? You will find. He who seeks, finds. But here in verse 34, it's the exact opposite from Jesus. There will be those who one day seek him, but it's too late. They will seek him in vain and not find who they are looking for. 
So what are we to make of Jesus' words here? How are we to understand this kind of warning? Well, if we are to put a theological term on it, this is what is called God's wrath of abandonment. God's wrath of abandonment. So often we think of God's wrath as a future reality, which it is. But there's also a present day expression of God's wrath. God's wrath takes many expressions, many forms. God's wrath of abandonment is when he turns his back on an unbelieving people. He removes his hand of restraining grace from hard-hearted rejectors and gives the people the sin they want. Allows their sin to find its fullest expression. And seals them in their rejection of him. We see this expression of God's wrath, wrath of abandonment throughout the scriptures. It doesn't take very long. In Genesis chapter 6, we see God's warning to an immoral, perverse world. The warning is this, the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive, it shall not abide, it shall not continue to restrain judgment with man forever. There will come a day when my patience runs its course, when my long suffering will end, when the sin of this world will be sealed. When does that come? Here in this passage, Genesis 7. The spirit's removed and water fills the earth. In Judges 10, Yahweh warns unbelieving Israel, you have forsaken me and served other gods. Hard-hearted rejection. You've forsaken me, therefore, here's my response. I will deliver you no more. Go. Cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you. God's chosen people are forced to experience the abandonment of God's divine protection. Why? Because of their sin. They've rejected him. Hard-hearted rebellion. They've turned away from him, gone after other gods. Their sinfulness is then sealed. Let those gods deliver you. This continues throughout. Second Chronicles 15. If you forsake him, he will forsake you is the warning. 2 Chronicles 24, you're transgressing the commandments of the Lord. You're not prospering. Why? Because you have forsaken Yahweh. He has forsaken you. Again, these are shocking statements. As you come into Romans chapter 1, New Testament, you find the same expression of God's wrath. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. It's against ungodliness and unrighteousness. It's against those who are suppressing the truth, pushing it down, pretending it's not there. They see the truth. They reject the truth. This is present day wrath. It's not future. This is present day. In what form does this wrath take? Verse 24, God gave them over to impurity. Verse 26, God gave them over to degrading passions. Verse 28, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do things which are not proper. Three times God gave them over, delivered over. It's an intense verb. It's judicial judgment. He commits them to prison is the word picture. He's judged them in his court of law. This word is used for rebellious angels who are judged and delivered and confined to the pit. This is God's wrath of abandonment. God, in the present day, giving an unbelieving people over in judgment, over to their own sinfulness, their rejection of him, sentencing them. 
confining them, sealing them in their unbelief. No more mercies given to them. The day of grace having come to an end. It's a sobering reality. There is a limit to God's patience. There comes a point when God simply lets unbelievers go. In the words of Proverbs 1, he turns them over. Let them eat of the fruit of their own way and be satiated, filled up with their own devices. Let them go their own way. It's repeated in Psalm 81, my people did not listen to my voice. Israel did not obey me. So I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart to walk in their own devices. Yes, God is long-suffering, but His patience is not eternal. It has limits. That's the case here in John 7. The chief priests and the Pharisees who stand before Jesus, Christ's patience, their day of grace was about to run out. It's quickly coming to an end. Read the text, starting in verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. And the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. Therefore, Jesus said, for a little while longer I am with you, then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews then said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He is not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? What is this statement that he said? You will seek me and will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. These five verses are a warning for anyone who reads this gospel. Remember the purpose of the gospel. Keep all this in context. John's gospel was written so that you may what? Believe. So that you may believe. I'm writing so that you will seek Jesus and find Jesus and believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And when you seek him and find him and believe him, you'll be given life in his name. That's the purpose. It's the great desire of John Believe who Jesus claimed to be. Come to the Father through him. Rest in his perfect life and death. His resurrection. Seek him. Find him. It's how the book begins. John and Andrew, what do they do? In John chapter 1, they, they seek Jesus. They find Jesus in verse 38. But here in John 7, that call to seek Christ, believe Christ, comes with a warning. Don't wait. Don't postpone faith. Do not delay because there will come a time when it is too late for you. J.C. Ryle has put it this way, it is far too much forgotten that there is such a thing as finding out truth too late. There may be convictions of sin, discoveries of our own folly, desires after peace, anxieties about heaven, fears of hell, but all too late. The teaching of Scripture on this point is clear and express. It is written in Proverbs, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Awful as it may seem, it is possible by continually resisting light and warnings to sin away our own souls. It sounds terrible, but it is true. Let us take heed to ourselves 
lest we sin after the example of the unbelieving Jews and never seek the Lord Jesus as a Savior till it is too late. The door of mercy is still open. The throne of grace is still waiting for us. Let us give diligence to make sure our interest in Christ while it is still called today. It's a warning, it's a plea, let's turn to the text. How does this play out? How does God's wrath of abandonment get sparked? What are the results? So we get in verse 32, we see God's wrath of abandonment is not a knee-jerk, quick, hasty reaction by God. No, it's a final response. And it's caused by an unbeliever's hard-hearted, consistent rejection of the gospel. Once God's patience has run its course. Notice first the hard-hearted dismissal by the Pharisees. The hard-hearted dismissal by the Pharisees. Verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. We're introduced to the Pharisees here. They're the guardians of Jewish tradition. They're the ones responsible for upholding the law of God. The ones out of all of Israel who should have been ready for the Messiah. Why? They're the ones closest to the scriptures. Closest to the messianic prophecies. In fact, the Pharisees, as you follow the book here, the Pharisees out of all the religious leaders of the land have been the ones who have had the most contact with Jesus' gospel. They were the ones back in John 1. They sent a delegation to question John the Baptist. John 1, 24, a delegation is sent specifically from the Pharisees. And they asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ? They're asking John or Elijah nor the prophet. John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you, he's here. Among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me. He's majestic, eternal. The thing of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. So the Pharisees hear John's testimony of the coming Messiah. He's here, they said. He's filled with greatness and majesty. He's among you. But not only that, the Pharisees also hear John's great confession, verse 29 of John 1. John sees Jesus, points at him, behold, he's the Lamb of God. That's him, the one among you. So the Pharisees are the first to hear of Jesus' arrival on the scene. But not only that, trace it through, the Pharisees also heard Nicodemus' testimony. About who Jesus was. Nicodemus specifically described as a man of the Pharisees. He comes invest, investigating who Jesus is. He hears Jesus call himself the Son of God. God so loved the world, he sends his Son. He hears Jesus refer to himself as the sacrifice for sin. He'll be lifted up on a pole. Jesus says to Nicodemus, I'm the son of man. I'm the royal divine son. Daniel 7, that's me. So it's testimony after testimony from the greatest of witnesses, John the Baptist and Jesus himself. But now as verse 32 opens, there's another testimony. It's added to the mix. This is the testimony of the crowd. Again, verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. What things? The things this crowd said about Christ in verse 31, in saving faith. Many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, when the Christ comes, the Pharisees hear the crowd confess Jesus to be the Messiah, the Christ, the hope of Israel. He's the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. They say he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? They hear the crowd believe the miracles of Jesus, those signs. 
Why single out the Pharisees here? This is by design. The way John records this adds intensity to the Pharisees' rejection. Why? Deuteronomy 19.15, on the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. So at this point in the story, the Pharisees have received three witnesses. John the Baptist, Jesus, and now the crowds. The matter should be confirmed. It's not. What do the Pharisees do with all of this evidence, all of this testimony? They reject its validity. They cast it aside in unbelief. It's this hard-hearted rejection. Notice the end of verse 32. Here's their response. The chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. And by mentioning the chief priests here, the implication is this. There has been a meeting that has taken place among the Sanhedrin. It's the official ruling body of Israel. Between verses 31 and 32, there's been a meeting, the supreme court of the land. They've held session. They've met about this man, Jesus. Back in verse 14, remember, in the midst of the feast, Jesus came up and he began to teach in the temple, in the court of the Gentiles. So he's teaching. Everyone's hearing this. Verse 28, teaching moves to proclamation, shouting. Jesus cried out in the temple. The Sanhedrin knows what's going on here, what Jesus is saying. From the court of the Gentiles, the Sanhedrin are only a stone's throw away. They met in a building. It was called the Chamber of Hewn Stone. They met right there in the temple precincts. It's a room attached to the temple wall where the 70 members... Plus the high priest met. Why? To decide official judgments. And their decision after meeting is Jesus must be seized, arrested, silenced. We must stop his gospel. Now note here that we have the Pharisees and the chief priests mentioned together. That's odd. That's a detail. That is odd. Because the Pharisees and the chief priests, they usually didn't get along. They didn't like each other. Almost all the chief priests were Sadducees. So they rejected much of what the Pharisees held. The Sadducees were more of the liberals. The Pharisees more of the conservatives. But here, these two groups of people, normally at odds with one another, they join together. They unite. Why? Because they're angry. They have a common enemy. We'll see it again in John 11. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees, again, that's odd. They join together, they convene a council. And they were saying, what are we doing? What are we doing? We need to act. For this man is performing many signs. We need to do something about him. We've talked too much. So verse 53, they plan together to kill him. Not just seize him now, kill him. Both parties, Pharisees and Sadducees, they're threatened by what Jesus is teaching. They're threatened by his gospel. They know what his message means for them. They know he's calling them to confess their spiritual pride. To relinquish all of their self-righteous achievements to turn over all of their self-glory to the Messiah of glory. That's his message. They know his gospel call. Yet after three testimonies, three witnesses, they should have believed. They send officers, verse 32, the temple police. These are armed guards led by the captain of the temple. They send officers to seize him, arrest him, stop his teaching. We need to put an end to his movement. Now notice the contrast. Verse 31, verse 32. 
the same gospel is pronounced. The response is radically different, though. Verse 31, many of the crowd believed, confess. Verse 32, the leaders reject. The leaders reject. If I were to borrow Paul's terms in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul puts it this way. The gospel carries with it an aroma. To some, it's the aroma of life. Eternal life, those who believe, but to others it's the aroma of death. They hate the message. That's what Paul says. We are a fragrance of Christ, God. Among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, always two groups, two responses. To the one an aroma from death to death, the other an aroma from life to life. It's the same gospel. Verse 31, we praise the Lord, His Spirit works, and there are those who believe, but here the leaders reject. And what should have been that third confirming testimony was soon to be the nail in their spiritual coffins. Notice second, as we see the spiral of the wrath of abandonment from the hard-hearted dismissal by the Pharisees, that leads to number two, the heaven-closing denunciation by Jesus. The heaven-closing denunciation by Jesus. Therefore, verse 33, therefore, in response to the leader's rejection, Jesus now seeing the temple police, clubs in hand, approaching him. He speaks with full assurance here. He knows the Father is protecting him. Remember verse 30. They were seeking to seize him. No man laid his hand on him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. The Father's protecting his son. He knows that. And so Jesus says, For a little while longer I am with you. Oh, you want to arrest me now? That's not going to happen. You want to try me? Now's not the appointed time. Now is not the time for evil to run its course. For a little while longer, I am with you. How does Jesus know this? How does he know the Father's protecting him? Well, there's inter-Trinitarian communication. The Father explaining this to his Son. But also there's a prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 of when the Messiah would actually die. It's not this year. It's next year. It's in six months. Jesus knows that. But notice verse 33 again, Jesus' words. For a little while longer, I am with you. This is more than a statement of time. This is a warning of impending spiritual disaster that could fall on this group. The warning is this, if these leaders continued in their hard-hearted rebellion against him, their hatred of him and his message, while he walked this earth, while he was personally with them, among them, teaching them, showcasing his messianic credentials, his miracles, showing that to them in person, then when he leaves them, when he ascends to heaven, that's the next phrase, verse 33, then... I go to him who sent me when he leaves their midst, when he leaves this earth, when he returns to his father in only six months from this point. He's saying there's no more hope for you. There's no more hope. The door of heaven will be shut on you. How do we know that? Because that's the warning that follows verse 34. After I leave, if you wait too long, after I leave, then you will seek me. That's a promise. It's a prophecy. Then you will seek me, and then you will not find me. Jesus is putting a time frame on God's patience. 
He's setting an expiration date for the remaining days of grace. They don't know the time frame. Jesus does know the time frame. This is always the case. No unbeliever knows when the patience of God will run its course. And thus the warning from Jesus here is do not dismiss the gospel for a later date. Do not dismiss it. Do not wait. Do not put Christ off for a later time. And here Jesus is just reiterating what the Old Testament taught Israel. This was Isaiah's message in Isaiah 55, 6. Seek Yahweh, seek Him. But then the caveat, while He may be found. Call upon Him is the command, while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to Yahweh, and He Yahweh will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Those are great promises. Great promises. Divine compassion. Abundant pardon. Forgiveness. But with those great promises comes that while clause. Seek the Lord while he may be found. The implication, he will not always be able to be found. It's exactly what Jesus says about himself here. You'll seek me, I won't be able to be found. Call upon him while he is near. Jesus is near now. He's in, in their midst. He's among them. I won't always be here. And Jesus is purposefully Echoing Hosea's warning in Hosea 5, 6. You can hear the similarities. Just listen to this. It was a warning given to the religious leaders, the priests. They had forsaken Yahweh. Hosea 5, 1 begins, Hear this, O priests, hear this, religious leaders of the land. The promise, they will seek the Lord, but they will not find Him. Same words from Jesus, and why will they not be able to find him? Watch this, because he has what? Withdrawn from them. Jesus is choosing Hosea's words. He's applying it to these religious leaders. And he's saying, I'm Yahweh. I'm Yahweh of Hosea 5. And you're disobedient Israel of Hosea's day. And it might be too late, because as Yahweh, like he did then, I will do now, I will withdraw myself from you. I'm going to leave you. I'm leaving you soon. I'm going to ascend to my Father. Their time is running out. In John 9, John 9, you have the same sense of urgency. In verse 4, Jesus even says, the night is coming. The night is coming. Day will not always be here. And no doubt there's agony in Jesus' words. You will find me. It's a sadness that will show itself in six months when Jesus will weep over this very city that rejects him. Now, as you fast forward the scene, you find that the majority of these religious leaders did not heed Jesus' warnings. One did. We know Nicodemus did. In fact, even at the end of this chapter in verse 50, you see Nicodemus, he who came to him before, being one of them, said to them, judge him by the law. He's taking a stand, at least beginning to take a stand with Jesus. The other Pharisees know that because verse 52, they answered him, you are not also from Galilee, are you? Are you one of his followers? But we see one of the Pharisees who will come to Christ in saving faith will heed Jesus' warning. But the majority did not. And what Jesus said absolutely came to pass. After Jesus ascends, Israel did seek the Messiah. 
But Israel never found the Messiah because the Messiah left. The story of Israel post-Jesus is this. Pseudo-Messiahs come on the scene and each time Israel chases after them. Only to be left with shattered dreams and crushed hopes. In fact, since Jesus' ascension, there have been over two dozen pretenders who have all claimed messiahship. More than 24 have come on the scene. Simon Bar Kokhba, he dies in 135 AD. Even in 1994, Meacham Schneerson, he comes and he says, I'm the messiah, I'm the hope. Over two dozen messianic pretenders, they all announce themselves as the Christ. They all gain a following. You know, all of them die and they stay dead, unlike Jesus. In fact, these false messiahs, they have been so prevalent throughout Israel's history. Listen to this quote. Today, most Jewish people do not believe in any personal messiah, past, present, or future. Some affirm belief uh, some believe in a future messianic age without a Messiah. Only a small group of Orthodox Jews believe that someday the Messiah will personally arrive. It's so sad. Sad to think of a messianic age without the Savior, without the Christ. But that's what Jesus promised. In vain would they search. Each time not finding the Messiah they needed. Look at verse 34. Jesus builds on the warning. He's now putting eternity in the balance. Notice the next words in verse 34. And where I am, referring to heaven, where I am, connected back to verse 33. I'm going to return to him who sent me. Where I am, God's presence, eternal glory, the heavenly abode of God, you cannot come. If you reject the true Messiah, reject me, there is no heaven for you. You cannot come. There's no hope. There's no future joy for you. Why? Because there's no answer for your sin. You're left in sin. Look at John 8. He's going to repeat this. Later on at this feast, he repeats the same thing, builds on it. Verse 21, same warning, I go away and you will seek me. Where I am going, you cannot come. Why? Jesus makes it very clear because you will die in your sin. To go where Christ is going, to enter the very presence of God, sin must be paid for. The only one who can satisfy God's wrath against sin is indeed the true Messiah, the Lamb of God who takes upon himself the sin of the world. But they're rejecting him. They don't want that. Without receiving that sacrifice through faith, no one can follow Christ to heaven. No one. No one can enter the presence of God. Again, verse 34, where I am, you cannot. You have no power, no ability, no hope. There's no amount of human efforts that can get you there. No amount of tradition keeping that can get you there. There's no hope, no ability, no power. Now compare this to what Jesus will tell those who do come to him in saving faith. What is Jesus' promise to those who believe? It's the exact opposite. John 14, 3, I will come again and receive you. I'll receive you to myself, that where I am, there you what? May also be, you'll be with me through faith. Again, for the believer, the gospel is the aroma of life. But for the unbeliever, it's the aroma of death. But Jesus knows his father's patience will soon run out. 
But knowing that it hasn't run out yet, in mercy, he issues this necessary warning. If you do not come to me soon, the doors of heaven will be closed on you. Which leads to number three. The haughty denial by the leaders. The haughty denial by the leaders. These leaders do not hear the Hosea 5, 6 echo. Their ears are closed. They do not see heaven's doors shutting. Their eyes are blind. In fact, they don't even think Jesus is talking about heaven at all. Even though it's the only conclusion you can come to. Again, verse 33, I go to him who sent me. I'm going to where the Father dwells. It's not cryptic language here. But they don't understand because, I think this gets to the heart of it, they don't understand because they can't imagine a heaven without them in it. Oh, we're going to be there. If anyone's going to be there, it's us. Notice what they say in verse 35. The Jews then said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? And the we here is emphatic that we of all people, we the keepers, guardians of the law, we're the ones closest to God. He can't be talking about heaven because we're going to be there, definitely. So their only conclusion is that he must be leaving Israel. He is not intending to go to the dispersion. He's not intending to leave Israel to live among the Greeks, the heathen. Is that what he means? And teach the Greeks, is he? The only place they can imagine Jesus going where they cannot go is the land of the Gentiles. This is religious pride. The ceremonially unclean people, the very people they hated and they despised, the very people who in their mind would never be allowed into heaven. That must be where Jesus is going. So Jesus' warning that soon heaven door, heaven's doors will be shut is only met with denial here, religious pride, a haughtiness. But notice verse 36. Though they deny Jesus' words, their consciences have been pricked. Jesus' warning has made them a little uneasy, a little less self-assured. So they ponder again Jesus' words. They ask amongst themselves, what? is this statement. We've come to our conclusion, but, but again, what is the statement that he said? Have we interpreted his words correctly? Should we be concerned? Ruminating on this, asking it again. They try to explain it away in verse 35. It didn't ease their consciences. And so they ask one another, what is this statement? You will seek me and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. And that is how this day that began in verse 14 comes to an end. Look at verse 37. Verse 37 here. Now the last day of the feast. It's going to be a shift to another day. But John concludes this day with a question. What is this statement? And he ends here because this is a question every reader of the gospel must answer for himself. It's like a pause. Will you be with Christ in glory? Will you be where Christ is going? Or will you not be able to go where Christ has gone? Will you seek him too late? Will you not find the Savior you need? Uh, no more important question will ever be asked. 
Heaven is only for those who come to Jesus in saving faith, believe his claims, and rest solely on his gospel, his perfect life lived for you, his death on your behalf, his resurrection unto glory for you. So John records this question because he wants us to not wait to come to Christ in saving faith. It's a probing question. Do not postpone your answer for another time. Do not put off your decision for another day. Come to Christ in saving faith now while he can be found. And this is why as you work your way through the New Testament, you see the, the calls to come to Christ are urgent calls. You see in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, you have that statement that we're ambassadors for Christ. And what are we doing? We are pleading. We're making an appeal. We beg you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Why the begging? Why the pleading? Why the urgency? Because, chapter 6, verse 2, Behold, now, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Don't delay. Put in the words of Hebrews 4. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. How will you respond to Christ's call to come to him, to seek him, to find him? Will you seek him with all your heart? Because that's the promise. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. When you come to him in saving faith, I will be found by you. When you hold nothing back of yourself, when you stop clinging to your own sin and turn from it, and you love Christ as person and his work with all your hearts. May this be our urgency as ambassadors for Christ. Our urgency. Let us not presume upon God's patience for that unbeliever in our lives. Let us plead, because now is the acceptable time. Father, I pray that your word would change us. And that your word would bring a greater conviction of what our calling is. And our calling is to be ambassadors for you. It doesn't matter where we work. It doesn't matter where we live. It doesn't matter the situation that we are in. Our calling, main calling, is to be an ambassador for you. Indeed, we would plead, while it's still day, Plead with those to come to Christ in saving faith. I pray, Father, if there are those who have put this off, may today be the day of salvation for them. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.